To everyone who listens to the Fishing the DMV on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, I am giving you guys a special deal. Between now and Saturday, October 21st, if you join Patreon, you'll receive a $20 gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. That's on top of all the other benefits and perks that comes with becoming a Patreon member. Again, that offer is only good until Saturday, October 21st. Check it out in the episode description down below, or you can click right above my head right here to join. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. I, hey, I just, had two, I just had two trips as well. I took a guy out two days, basically two days in a row, and uh, we caught over 150 fish. Oh my God. I mean, that's, uh, that's including the small ones. Um, our biggest were, he caught two 18s in one day. And then the next day, the biggest was, uh, was a 17, but I mean, that's over 150 fish. Dude, that's freaking insane. Um, guy, I mean, uh, three, two, one, and we're live. I mean, you guys know this gentleman, you, you know who he is, you know, the legend, uh, he runs every <laughs> Potomac. Uh, I, I want to get to the fishing port here in a minute, but what part of the Potomac would you want to spend more time on? I'm talking from like Great Falls all the way up to um, Paw Paw. If you'd have one section that you just spend time on for fun, just to learn a little bit more, what, what section would that be? Oh, what section? Probably, um, I, I can't really get my boat in there, but that section below Seneca. Mm. Pennyfield? Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could spend more time there. Boy, that'd be fun. That's definitely but rafting I, I water. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I know there's people that use a jet boat in there, but, um, uh, you know, the water has to be so high, and uh, I can't afford to bang my equipment up and then wait three weeks for it to get fixed. Have you spent a lot of time in the Shepherdstown area? Yeah, I do trips on the DL up there. <laughs> it's, it, why is that so hush-hush quiet, you think? I don't know. I don't know, but I go up there. I, I really like it. Uh, right now, though, if people are going to go up there... Um, you're going to have to go out of Shepherdstown because uh, uh, Dargan boat ramp, I believe, is shut down. Oh, I didn't let, know. Let, let's get on this real quick. Edwards Ferry is shut down, I know for a fact. I was just there by boat the other day on a trip, probably four days ago. I stopped there because um, they have uh, bathrooms and stuff. And then um, uh, Dargan is shut down. Hmm. And there's another one further north, but uh, I don't, I don't guide up that way. Dargan. That's interesting. Yeah. What happened with Edwards Ferry? Uh, they're, they're just re renovating the bridge, re uh, putting a new one in. They put one in, but I guess it was a temporary one. Hopefully it's wider. Yeah. I don't know what they're going to do. Hopefully they get it done soon and, and um, stop messing with these parks and, and let us just enjoy them. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking the other day, actually, and then and then, guys, you know, just for you to know that when we're recording this, it's like October fifteenth, I believe. Just to, if you want some context here for mid October, it. yeah, the river donkeys are on the move. Yeah, the fishing on the Potomac River is about to heat up, and really, the fishing everywhere is about to heat up here too as we get into the you know the full fall swing, not the fall transition, but full fall feed. Um, it, that whole area of the Upper Potomac is interesting with the the CNO Canal there. And I really wish they would just flood that thing and give us that whole canal to fish because that would be really cool. I know there's some sections that is open, but it would be neat if they'd actually like flood that whole thing and give us the ability to fish that too. And that's just a up side around thought. Dickerson, up around Dickerson, that water, it's full of water. Always yeah. is. Yeah, yeah Dickerson it, is. Um, you can catch fish in there. Hancock, there's some areas too. Up near Pawpaw, there's some areas. But but I digress. It's just something I wanted to bring up there. But yeah, yeah, that uh, that Shepherdstown area is so interesting because more and more people are asking me to get somebody on to also talk about that a little bit more too. That Shepherdstown area, and, and to me, I feel like the Upper Potomac is the main stem, and then you have Big Slack up to Paw Paw, but then you kind of forget that section below Big Slack and then towards Harper's Ferry. People just don't talk about that. Well, I mean, I, I fish from uh, Seneca all the way up to uh, Dam Four. What what do you think about that area specifically? Is it is it more of a wintering area, a summer area? Um, it's a little bit of everything. Uh, there's deep water there for winter time. Um, there's some big fish up there too. 
it's just it's got a lot of good habitat. There's a lot of big rocks, big ledges, mm. you know, and um, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of areas that are swift and a lot of areas that are slow. It's got a little bit of everything. We are now in the fall season and you've been hyping this up for a long time about it's coming. It's coming, boys. <laughs> it's coming. So we're here. It's October. What's the fishing been like? It's been a while since we've had you on to really talk well, about this. At first, there was like a buildup. There was a buildup, and uh, there were, there were days where it was slow. We'd catch some fish, but it, it just uh, it just didn't work out for us. Um, I mean, when you fish every day, there's a you're gonna have days where good days and bad days. And then um, just recently, after this last, after it started getting cold for the second time, I would say this is the second cold front that we've had come through. And, and this one really justifies October, you know, this one, this one we're getting right now. Um, I mean, I think the temperature outside right now is 50 degrees, 49 degrees right now at my house. And um, it, it's, it's really, uh, I think it's really put them into a, a state of um, emergency. Um, I, I feel like too, uh, with these rivers, smallmouth, at least on the Potomac River, I mean, I've been fishing the Susquehanna too. I've been guiding on that too. But the, the Potomac, the upper Potomac River, um, what, what, what you'll see is you'll see a lot of little fish first, smaller smallmouth. And they, sent, they, they, they seem to come out in, in numbers. And then they feed first. And then as you keep fishing, as it gets, gets colder and colder into the fall, you start seeing a different class of fish, which is better. They're bigger. And um, that's what you're looking for. And right now, that transition is happening. Yeah, it's so interesting because, like, in different parts of the country, you know, October is either late fall or maybe you're just beginning the fall transition. Here, you know, this is just getting into the good stuff because I really feel like fall fishing isn't just October. And I feel like everyone, again, just believes, like, we get so tricked because of corporate America and the calendar. And the fall is October because of Halloween. And then November is Christmas. And so you think clearly in your mind that November is the winter time, but honestly, November is also part of that, that fall bite too. Oh yeah. Uh, beginning of November is a, a really good time. Real good time. Even um, around um, Halloween. I'm still mm -hmm. waiting for someone to book a trip on Halloween. I love fishing on Halloween for some reason. I just feel like it's always a good day. What, what really clued you in recently to like it switching over to that fall bite? The um, uh, water temperature, the night temperatures. Okay. They're starting to stay in the high 40s. They're not coming out. Mm, gotcha. And I, I think we've transitioned really well into fall so far. We're not getting, ter you know, it, it's, um, we're, we're uh, the water's cooling down um, gradually as of right now. What has the grass been like? It's dying off. It's good for us, but it's bad because um, all you do is suck it up in your jet motor and then you got to stop and get it out and keep going. But um, as it keeps dying, those fish keep getting exposed, those small ones, and then uh, they become food and those jerk baits really come into play. I didn't even think of that, like the cannibalistic nature of smallmouth and the fact that a lot of these baby smallmouth are basically dinner. I, all those fish are. I mean, um, a fish will... It doesn't matter the fish. If the fish is smaller than the other fish, the big fish will eat it. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Yeah, They'll at least try is, to. That is nature, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the bigger you are, the badder you are in that river. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that it's so funny because like with all these colder conditions, you think that would be like a turnoff because it has been a little bit chillier. But that's just us as people. It's not the fish. The fish don't feel that same thing. It's a light switch for them. Yeah, no, they they uh, they know that the uh, winter's coming and th and they're uh, you know they want to prepare for it, so they're going to start eating, eating heavier than they they were in the summer. I'm really getting nervous here because I do have like I have two tournaments coming up on the Upper Potomac at Big Slack. I think back to back weekends, and I'm like trying to figure out if they're going to be full transition or full fall mode, and I think they aren't going to be in the full fall mode. But my biggest thing is the grass and it dying like this, it just is going to limit the type of baits I can throw up there to where you can't, 
I, depending, you can't like throw a crankbait or a jerkbait depending on the on the water and all the vegetation. How how do you deal with all that when you have the grass? Do you just leave if there's too much grass, or do you fish? No, through? throw throw plastics. Okay. And maybe instead of throwing like a a, a sixteenth ounce, go to a three thirty second ounce, so you can mm. get it to the bottom. And if maybe not a three thirty second ounce, go to a, a one eighth ounce. I'm assuming but, you're going to go Texas rig. Yeah, but you have to um, be aware of the heavier you go, the more likely it is you're going to um, get your jig heads um, wedged in the bottom of the river on rocks and um, in between trees and stuff. So you always want to be as, as light as you can possibly get away with. What's the lightest you've ever gone? Just weightless? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go weightless. Like when the water gets real low, Real clear, use something like a uh, a fluke weightless or a uh, um, a cinco, and um, five inch cinco's, five inch flukes. They look gigantic if you're a smallmouth fisherman, but the smallmouth hit them. And the reason why you'd go to a five inch is so you can throw it as far away from the boat as possible. Yeah, that's dude. Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up because the fluke is a pain in the freaking. I, I fished that three weekends ago now i think it was a tournament i was a dumbass i fished it weedless style like an idiot and i'm working that thing and i had two or three one really good one smoke the shit out of it but yep. as soon as i tried to come back in to hit him nothing like how the hell do you fish that thing to have success well you're going to fish it on a slack line because you want it to just kind of um float through the water and maybe fall to the bottom at some point in time because a five inch Senko or a four inch Senko is going to, it's going to fall uh, regardless of weight or not. I like to use a, a three out hook on a um, five inch Senko and a, I have yum. I have five inch yum. Um, yum dingers, I guess they're called. Yeah. I have uh, four inch ones too. I pour four inch ones and the, the four inch ones I use two out hooks. So that adds a little weight to that, to the bait. And um, you fish it on a slack line, but you have to be um, very uh, aware of, of where your line is. And, um, you know, you, you want to you use braid to some type of fluorocarbon leader. And um, you're going to feel a tick. Like it's going to, you're going to feel a thump on the line or your line's going to start going upriver. And you, you have to be able to uh, reel that slack line in before you set the hook. I think that's really big because, like, I think the other thing that I realized was you could do a um, a nose hook for it, uh, which, yeah. which can work well too. But the problem is, again, it's like it's just not going to be as weedless, and and that's really the rub right now in the river is you oh, are the limited. Wacky rig. Yeah, the wacky rig weedless will work too, real well. Or uh, throw a wacky rig on a sixteenth ounce, um, three thirty second, or a uh, eighth ounce. I also hear um, the thing I'm going to try this weekend here too is a swim jig too. I keep hearing people saying the chatterbait and the swim jig work. I want to try to get that in the rotation more for smallmouth. Yeah. For some, I, I just, I've, dude, I've never thrown a chatterbait for smallmouth, and I know it's stupid. I just, I never have. I'm, I'm old school, I guess. I have them behind me. Oh, I, can't. I just, yeah, I have them behind me. No, the ch chatterbaits catch big smallmouth, catch real big smallmouth. Um, I just use uh, natural colored uh, chatterbaits, you know, browns, greens. White stuff like that. And, What's your favorite um, one that's behind you? Favorite color is probably a. Uh, um, just a straight brown one. Is this it? Well, this is green pumpkin, but it looks brown. If you can see it. Yeah, hold it just for a split second there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a three eighth ounce. You can go to a half ounce too. Three eighth ounce is perfect. Some people think the hook's a little big for it. It's a, what is it? A five odd hook maybe on these, but um, no, these, I mean, the, these are catching really good fish. Um, but I find that they work very well this time of year when you have higher water, not clear water. You want, you want, um, you want stain, heavily stained to dirty looking water. Why? 
because that seems to be how um, when they'll strike these. Other than that, um, a spinner bait with willow leaf blades. Oh, dude, I've not heard a spinner bait for smallmouth in a long time. Yeah, three eighth ounce or a half ounce, depending on how swift the water is. If the water's real swift, you want a you want a half ounce chatter bait or a half ounce uh, swim bait or spinner bait. Uh, why is it the spinner bait is so overlooked for smallmouth? I, I guess because uh, most people think they uh, come in just they're just re- very large. Because I've always and, found that fascinating. Where that's a like again, it, isn't that true? It's like with the chatter bait, the swim jig, a swim bait itself. An underspin, uh, it, it, you just don't think... That, maybe it's because there's just too many techniques almost, and you just can't fish them all, which is the biggest problem. Well, the um, chatterbait, you just don't want to throw it out and reel it back in. You want to almost yo-yo it back to the boat. Like you would with a blade bait. Yeah, and f- flutter it. Let it flutter, and then start it up again. Slow it down, start it up, kill it. Let it start, and pick it back, you know, pick it back up in the water and keep going. So slow and fast, slow and fast. You just want to alternate that, just like you would like a crankbait. Mm, okay. To, you guys, that's a good tip right there. Of, yeah, to do some type of strike. But these, uh, I mean, I, I can't tell you enough how big of a, um, how big these chatterbaits come into play um, when, when we do get a rise in the river in the fall and um, how big the fish are that hit these. What's the biggest fish uh, that you've seen so far? Uh, recently, we caught one over by the uh, uh, power plant on the Potomac. Um, he was uh, he was over five pounds. Dude. And he was on a Senko, man. A weightless Senko, five-inch Senko with a three-out hook. All the That's stuff nice. that I talk about, that people hear me talk about, I, I, um, I have it available to them. Let me so, go through. What, what do you got in your store right now? You got all the tackle behind you. Let's pimp through that stuff. I got, I got the uh, Z-Man chatter baits. I have the, um, well, of course, I, I sell tubes, as people know. I sell um, uh, the Ned rigs. Let's see here. Let me see if I can get this thing to look up a little bit. I sell the crank baits, the jerk baits. Oh, um, another one that seems to be working real, real are pretty good is this uh the micro um the micro trd those micros those micro z-mans yep you know this how long have i been telling you to throw those bad boys <laughs> yeah no they work pretty good and i tell you i don't have them i don't have my own jig head for them i use their jig head it seems to work pretty good but for all this other stuff I use a jig head that I pour, a finesse jig head. But these, um, let me see here. I'll show you the three. No, I guess there's four colors that have been working in this clear water. I don't, I don't have the, it would be five colors. So it probably doesn't really matter what you're throwing as long as you're throwing one of these. I don't have the green, I'm out of, the, out of stock in a green pumpkin. But I have green pumpkin uh, Ned rigs. But you got this, uh, this copper truce. You guys see that color? Hmm. Um, Has that been working pretty well? Yeah, it's been working pretty pretty good. Uh, California crawl. Um, yeah, California crawl. I'll tell you which ones seem to be working really well right now for me. Are the Canada crawl? I think people know about Canada crawl. Canada crawl. I've never heard of that one before. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're going international here. Canada crawl. <laughs> so, yep, those seem to be working real well, and they go they go well on one of these one of these jig heads right here that I pour. I don't know. Can people see those? I can see it. You see it? Yeah. Oh, nice. It's a number one wide gap hook. Wow. It's a finesse hook. SWFA finesse hook. I call it. And um. Those things hook the heck out of the fish. And then, as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talk about. And I would suggest with those type of hooks like that that don't have a a, a guard keeper, just to put a tap of super glue on there just to be safe. Um, just to keep, we, uh, keep it nice and snug. I throw them with uh, 
I just that 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 hook right there is meant to have those uh, those baits Texas rig. So oh the um yeah I say I, I told you California crawl. I was I forgot to give the names copper truce. There's one called Houdini that seems Ooh. to work pretty well. It's like a white and white and brown or or off white and brown. So yeah. But uh, and the jerk baits, oh, the crank baits will play part play a good um, role this uh, fall too. The um, when does that really kick in? Whenever you have uh, when that grass goes away. If you can get into an area where it's real clear, you know the uh, clear of uh, debris, grass and stuff, those crank baits will work. And the um, there's four different brands I think that work real well. But the two that work the best, I think, are Bandits and uh, Rapala. Mm. And they're 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 up here. But Bandits, Rapala, Lucky Craft, Lucky Craft work well, and so do the uh, the uh, KBD ones, the Strike Kings. What's but that, the Strike King favorite? ones are quiet. They don't what rattle. What are your favorite color crankbaits right now? If you had to pick two, two would probably be. Um, Let's see here. Probably these two colors. They almost look identical, but um, like a crawdad color. One's one's called olive green crawdad. You guys see that? Oh, that looks nice. I like that color. Olive green. And then this one is a dark brown crawdad. Ooh. Dude. And they're just DT4, so they only dive four feet. So they work, Dude, they is, work pretty well. That is slick. You know something else I really want to try at some point huh. is an umbrella is an umbrella rig. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, the um, umbrella rigs work good too. And then if you're gonna um I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you, oh I have them right here. Right now the uh, jerk bait to use would be something like a pointer sixty five. They're what three inches long. If you can see that, can people see that? Oh, I see that. Yeah, Ooh, right there. Nice. It's just something like in a, um, you know, like a bluegill perch, some type of color like that. And then another one that'll work. This is a. I don't. I don't have these. I don't have these in stock. I just. I have to buy these um, on my own. But these are Rapala um, X wraps. These are sixes. These aren't eights. I have eights. But this is the same thing as a pointer 65. And, and the other thing I would suggest to you guys is Megabast also came out with some BFS jerk baits as well. These jerk baits are two and a half inches long. And they're um they're tearing them up. So. I like that color too. Like it, it just looks like it'll catch a smallmouth. Yeah, th this this is called clown. It's pretty pretty cool uh little lure. You know what so I would then, I I really wish these bait companies would do is with these smaller jerk baits give them a little bit bigger bill so when you're working the hole you can get it down deeper. And then here's a uh Rapala Husky jerk. If you don't want to spend the money on a uh Rapala X wrap, the Husky jerk is the next one down. And that's a very good lure. What size fishing line are you using? Um, I use 20 pound braid, but that's equivalent to a gamma braid. It's equivalent to eight pounds of line, eight pound monofilament. And then I use, um, I'm using, uh, eight pound fluorocarbon. I use eight pound fluorocarbon. Do you think that I'm makes sorry, a difference? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Not, not, not for the, uh, not for the jerk baits. I'm using a uh, 10 pound um, monofilament for the jerk baits. Why? I just think that um, the uh, monofilament will float. I think it helps those lures suspend a little bit better. And I want 10 pound line because I'm, I'm popping it through the water. And when you're popping it through the water, it kind of beats the line up a little bit. And also, um, if you're fishing around rocks, these lures also cost and upwards of 10 to 15 to 20 dollars depending on what brand you have i don't want to lose them on rocks and lose the fish so i use 10 pound monofilament nothing special 
you know, it's, trialing. You know, it's crazy is in certain circumstances, I do the exact same thing with crankbait fishing. So if I'm fishing the tidal Potomac in certain instances, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll throw it on spinning tackle, but I'll have 15 pound braid and I'll just throw straight braid. And the reason is if I get it snagged on like a snag uh, on a piece of wood or something like that, I can just pull the damn thing out there and not worry about it, but I still get the casting distance and I can still fish slow. And I think that's a really good combo for me. And, and so that's something to definitely think about if you don't have a budget don't be afraid to go with, with some braid just so you can keep your bait on there too. Yeah. You want to go monofilament to a, uh, I mean a braid to a monofilament um, leader. And also when those fish hit that jerk bait, they usually hit it pretty hard because you're popping it through the water. And when you go to, sometimes when you go to pop, they nail it. And uh, that um, monofilament tends to stretch. It's like a shock absorber. So you don't rip those hooks out of their face or out of their mouth. Um, but but for plastics right now, with the water as clear as it is, I mean it's crystal clear on the Potomac. You, you want to use um, you want to use fluorocarbon. No, that you want to use sense. Um, eight pound, six pound, or eight pound fluorocarbon. How much of a difference do you think there really is between fluorocarbon and mono when it comes to visibility? Um, like a little or a lot? No, a little. But I, I don't think they can see that fluorocarbon at all. Yeah. And I know the smallmouth are, are line shy. Talk about that. I, I think that's don't I don't think people talk about that enough. I, I know for a fact they are. Um, if you were to tie a lure straight to braid and work it in the water like a, a plastic or a uh, um, even a crankbait or something like that, they uh, for some reason they just won't hit it like they will if it's uh, if it's got monofilament or uh, fluorocarbon on it. I think they can see it. I mean, I, I, I know they're fish, but I, I, I think they, they know something's wrong with it and they just I don't mean, want to do it. I wonder at what point the, it's so pressured that it's worth doing that, you know, like think about it this way. So everything there's like, there's a percentages and at a certain percentage, something happens. So it gets cold enough outside or we lose enough daylight that fish know it's fall because vegetation dies off. So vegetation knows that there's going to be not enough sunlight and it gets cold enough that at this point we trigger. We don't know the percentages, but that's the case in the same breath. At some point, fish get line shy. What point is that? And that is such an interesting question. I think about is like, when is it? So the water's pressured? real clear. You think it's clarity of water? Yeah. When it's real, real clear. I I've done this before. I've had kids on the boat. I've had one, one, uh, one brother catching all these fish and the, and that brother is teasing the other brother. These are just, these are just kids saying he's catching all the fish and the, and the younger brother's getting all upset. Um, I took the older brother's line and tied direct, tied his lure directly to braid and his little brother kept the, um, fluorocarbon leader on. And I kid you not. His little brother started catching more fish than him. And then I switched it back. I, I just feel like there's like, I agree with that, but I feel like there's something else too. Cause like you see this a lot when, um, when top water season comes in that first uh-huh. few, first few weeks of top water season, Oh, they'll hit anything. And then all of a sudden it's like, they've seen a buzz bait or a popper 500 times and they shy away uh-huh. because so many people fish it. And I wonder too, if that's what happens with, with the line size is there are so many people floating with kayaks and tubes and shit. And so that small mouth behind that rock that you've seen six times, he's like, that is the fifth Cinco I have seen with 12 pound test fluorocarbon. Yeah. Like, I feel like that plays into it too. I mean, the clearer the water gets, the sneaker you're going to have to be. I mean, if you can see them, they can see you. And that's why that those weightless baits are so sneaky and why they hit them. It's just something probably about the way it floats into the water. And you could also get them so far away. Yeah. From the boat. Yeah, dude, that's that's crazy. Yeah. And but passing the, um, distance. Yeah. Yeah. It's four, six pound, six pound line, I think, is kind of pushing it because the, the small mouth can pull harder than that, even if they don't weigh six pounds, um, if they're in current and stuff. And um, they can snap your line because sometimes you don't even know. You can check your line, but there could be just the slightest nick in the line. And, um, and, and they'll get away. They'll snap the line. Especially I, I, also, a big one. 
I also think there's there's a couple of other factors here. Um, one is is the water temperature. So I I don't know if this is true or not. So chat, please let let me know in the comment section if you think this is true. An old timer told me this that when it's cold, fish don't see as well. I ah. don't know if that's true or not, but he was saying the reason an umbrella rig, for example, works so well in the winter time is they can't see the metal leader as well. I literally have no idea if that's true or not, but that's why he thinks you can get away with certain things. Um, I've heard the guys in the Susquehanna use those umbrella rigs up there. I've never used one, but they're no, actually successful up there. I haven't used them either. I just thought it was interesting. It's like it, you, these techniques that you've never used on the river before. If you're the first one, you always get rewarded. It's the same thing with like the, the tidal Potomac uh, last spring. This dude was fishing. Hold on. I'll show you. This dude was fishing something massive like this. This is a, for comparison. Uh, it's a big bait. It's a big bait. And he was fishing a glide bait on the tidal Potomac. And he was like the only guy doing it. And he and he won like, you know, $50,000 because he was the first one. The fish never saw it. So it's interesting. If you're the first one to throw something on the river, dude, those fish just go ape for it. Yeah. But um, where was my point? Oh, about line size and stuff like if you're going to be fishing this time of year, and this is my suggestion, guys. You don't have to listen to this. Make sure your drag is set well, um, especially in the summertime when I fished all those tournaments up at Big Slack uh, and Diam 4. I, I don't know why, but this is, it happened for me. If you set the hook and that thing shoots off like a bottle rocket, it probably means it's a dink. It's a smaller one. If you set the hook and immediately it just wallows for a second, that is a big old son of a bitch. Because those big ones, for some reason, they first act like they're not hooked. Then they take off. I don't know why, but that's at least in my experience it is. Make sure your 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 drag is set up properly so the drag fights the fish. You know, don't try to just winch that that guy in as hard as possible. Cause I I again I feel like the harder you fight a smallmouth, the harder he's gonna fight back and he's gonna go straight up in the air and start jumping a lot. Well, he's gonna throw the hook. Even underwater, yep. they can throw the hook. Yep. And uh, you can also rip the hook out of their mouth. Like literally rip it out of their mouth because uh Maybe they're not hooked well enough. If you have good drag set, you can catch fish with the, uh, you can catch a, a really nice smallmouth uh, with their um, with the hook being poorly in their mouth. You know, just like skin hooked. Yeah. I need some stories. Do you have any people? You don't have to name names uh, that you've taken out that like they just winched on that fish like they were just trying to pull in a net as fast as possible. Yeah, I've, I've had people, uh, I've had people, they, they mess with my drag on my reels and then they lose a fish. And I'm like, well, what? I said, why isn't your drag? Why isn't your drag working? Oh, I tightened it down. I said, well, that's why the fish got away. I said, you have to have a light drag mm -hmm. because they're head shaking. I think a small mouth, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever done this type of, um, uh, like research on them, at least in freshwater, pound for pound, I bet you they head, head shake harder than any fish in freshwater. I would like, I wish there was a study done on that. That'd be actually pretty cool. I mean, they just head shake so hard because, because I'll catch large mouth and small mouth together. And, uh, you know, large mouth has to be, um, have to ha has to have some size to it before you r really feel how, um, how strong they are, you know? I mean, that they, they have to be several pounds, three, four, five pounds. But a, a, a small mouth, when they're a pound, two pounds, or I mean, even when they're bigger, when they head shake, I mean, they could throw that hook underwater. Mm -hmm. And if, if, you're, if your line's not tight, I, I mean, if your drag's not set properly, um, then you're either going it, to, it, the fish is either going to find the, the knot that's been tied wrong or, or poorly, either in the leader or the uh, hook, or somewhere on your line, your leader line's going to fail. That's because nice. they've rubbed you on a rock or something like that. <clears throat> That's why it's so important to have you match the hook, the bait, and your rod. Um, I had this incident a, a week or two ago where I was out there, and I was using a my, my medium light rod with a with, well, it's, it's i don't have it with me right now but it's it's basically the 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 z-man micro trd and i have it on a i think it's called a kitech 
uh, tungsten hook. It's a, it's a sticky sharp hook. It's insanely sharp. It's a Japanese hook. It's a super finessey setup. And then what I did is I cut that off and I put a tickler on a love the tickler. Like a, yeah. But I put it on like a, a, a three aught hook and I set the hook two or three times and I got nothing. And I think it was because I had a mushy rod on five pound test fluorocarbon leader and I was making long casts and I couldn't get a hook in them. I switched to a medium heavy rod in the boat. No problem. Like it, it's what so. You, what are you going to say? I was going to say, it's just crazy how making those adjustments can help you. If you, um, I feel like your rod, your, your reel is um, the drag set well on it. Um, I, I feel, you know, when it's set well is when you go to set the hook on a fish and you can hear the drag a little bit when you pull back on a spinning reel. I'm not talking about a bait caster. Yes, but I think the issue will be, and this is getting, we're getting down a rabbit hole, boys. If you have it dialed in for a, a super finesse hook and then you yeah. flip to a thick hook, the drag is still going to go out, but then you're not going to get the hook penetration. Yeah. So it's almost like you have to, I think you almost have to adjust the drag depending on what you're throwing. Because if you're punching a mat, the drag might be set differently than if it's a nano hook. And I, I just kind of had that epiphany the last time I was out there was like, oh, I can't take an ultralight rod and with the drag set up that way, put on a bigger hook, make a cast and, and wail on them and expect to get any hook penetration. You got, it's so crazy. The whole system has to match. Everything has to well, be Well, you know, you know what I've learned too is you, you can't just, I like using medium light rods for smallmouth, but there's certain times where a medium light rod isn't enough yeah. to get them to the boat. And um, uh, that's when you want to go to a medium rod. Mm -hmm. And the medium rod can um can pull them to the boat uh because you don't want to be messing with your drag when you have a fish on the line that's how you lose them no no i mean you really don't and, and the only i would okay so i as always guys say like there's no absolutes in fishing if you think he's super big then you can adjust your drag a little bit to make sure he runs but besides that no don't don't touch your drag um I would only loosen it up if I think it's a big one and I just want him to run, 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 and run. Yeah, and you don't want to, um, you always want to keep your line tight. Yeah. And you don't want to keep, you don't want to make these quick, jerky motions to the left and right. Once you have your rod up in the air, like straight up and down, that's how you, that's, a, that's how, I'm talking about plastic baits. I mean, I know sometimes they catch you off guard and your rod tips down and you have to pull to the left or right. And depending on where you are, if you're under trees or something, but, um, to really get a good hook set in a small mouth on the river, you want to look. You want to lift up, and once you lift up and you hook them, you want to keep your rod tip up. Yes, and, and let's add to that too because I took. I'm trying to teach my wife how to fish, and I think you've seen probably the meme of her when she took a fish and she launched it about 200 feet straight up and it hit the deck like a comet. Um, because I told her she's never done it before. Pull straight up, so she's like, okay, whoom, and that son of a bitch went airborne. What we mean is keep tension. It doesn't mean yank that thing out of the water like you're trying to pull a carrot out. Um, keep tension. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and a hook set, and there's different types of hook sets. Yeah. You can have a hook, hook set where you're just pulling back and reeling. Yes. That's a hook set. But it depends on what you're doing, where you are, and how they're biting. Um, but you never want to just try to rip a... Um, you see on TV those big hook sets and Bassmasters with a... Um, with a uh, rubber skirted jig and they're using uh bait casters there's there's real big hook sets um that doesn't seem to work very well with smallmouth. It, it it's always it's always some type of uh finesse hook set you know you just want to stick them you want to get them good and lifting straight up is uh, how you want want to um hook them and you want to hook them in the roof of their mouth you want to hook them in the roof of your mouth. You want to keep pressure. I would say pressure. Um, and, and then this is a big thing too. Again, my opinion, you guys could let me know in the comment section if you think it's right. Don't pull straight up as hard as possible. And this is the reason. A small mouth wants to jump. And yeah. when they jump, that's when they spit. And I've seen so many young anglers, they just they put the rod up as tight as they can. They just start cranking like this. Well, what you're doing is you're telling that small mouth to come up to the surface that's when you're going to have trouble set up, keep some tension and then just, and then lower the rod down a little bit, like start here at 12 and slowly bring it across your body. So that way you're keeping tension on him, but you're not pulling him 
straight up as hard as possible to the surface. Because again, every time a small mouth jumps, you have a chance of losing your bait. Let him yeah, do. And, they, um, and the second you let your line go slack, yeah. You, if it's a really good, if it's a really big small mouth, really old big small mouth, yeah. So, somehow when your line goes slack for a split second, they're gone. Yeah, exactly. And then I know comment section is probably gonna say like, but you know, when we went out together, I was boat flipping them. It's like, yeah, but I was fishing a specific setup with 15 pound fluorocarbon. So I could, where I was just set the hook three winches. I could boat flip them. If you're mm -hmm. using six pound test, I would not suggest boat flipping these bigger small mouth, you know, fight them and use the net. Yeah. Net's a big thing on river small mouth. Oh dude. If you're not using a net. You're you going to lose some of them. You could do a clinic on that though, because example is current. People don't think about this. If, if you are, if you're to the right of me and I'm, I'm up on the front of the boat and I'm fishing and I'm pulling this thing and the fish is down current of us. Well, if you stick the net in the water, what happens? The net, is washed downstream. So now you're screwed. So like, there's another level of like, okay, if you want to land them, you need to get the fish up current of the net so that the fish mm -hmm. can go in unless you're trying to stab at it. So like, there's another layer there. And then if you have treble hooks, there's something else there that you got to be careful with that net job, because if you leave that net in the water and there's trebs, dude, that is a great recipe for some sadness, right? Yeah. There. You don't want to hit the fish either on a hook with a no. net. You God, hit the no. fish with a net. Uh, usually they're gone too. Oh, dude, I, I screwed that up. My wife hooked a massive one. This is the tournament we won. I mean, she's sitting in the back of the boat. She looks sad. She's just, just throwing this thing out, reeling it, reeling it for six hours. All of a sudden, she gets a... No way in hell this happens. She smokes one. She doesn't know what the hell she's doing, and she's reeling this thing. She's like, I'm stuck, and this thing comes out of the water. And I'm like, of course. Of course she does it. She catches it. Kids and first-timers always get the biggest fish. It's just the rule of the world. And she gets thing, this thing to the side of the boat. And I look at the GoPro footage and I look like a dumb monkey humping a football because I'm sitting there and I look like I'm shanking a guy on the side of a street. I'm just stabbing this thing into the water. What happens? The fish gets spooked. It gets moved. I stab in there a third time. It gets a treble hook in the side of the net. And what I end up doing is just picking this fish up out of the water like this. He shakes, comes off, lands in the bottom of the boat. I did everything yeah. so horrific. Do not do anything I did. It was horrifically terrible. But that's what will happen. You'll get the hook stuck on the outside of the net, and your only choice at that point is you have to just yeet it into the boat because he'll shake it off in the water right there, and you'll lose him. I think it, it sounds silly, but I think there there's a technique to netting fish. And um, you never put the net in the water until you can get the fish. Really? Until you know for a fact you can net the fish. Don't ever put it in the water. Well, and I think this is an you issue. You can have it ready, hovering over the yeah. over the edge of the boat, and um, when you're when that moment comes, reach down and grab the fish because there's a lot of fish that jump out of the water, and I catch them in the net when they're when they're in the air. Well, and this is something I think too. This is something I think I've really gotten better at this year. Was just fight them, let them get tired. I, I feel like people, you get so excited, you hook a nice one. And your thought is like, I have to crank him in the boat as fast as possible when I have light line. Let your drag and your rod do the work. If you get a good hook into him, let's, let's say it's a um, it's a tickler or, or a Nedrick, that's a good hook that should be in them. You should got him pretty good. Let the drag wear the fish out so by the time you get him to the side of the boat, he's not hot. Yeah. You know, if you winch that four-pound smallmouth right to the boat and he's hot and he's flailing all over the place, that makes netting him a nightmare. Yeah. No, you're right. And it's became a netting seminar, but it's like, it's important stuff because like I think I was guilty of this until this this summer where it's just you just you don't understand that next part of the game is like once you set the hook, play him out, get him tired, that way netting is easier. Where's your net guy? Is the current a factor? Do you have treble hooks? Uh, Cuz those big smallmouth dude, you're right. Those those old mean ones, man. Especially this time of year when they get hot and they start jumping more and they get fired up. Yeah, those trophy smallmouth that are, they you know they consider a twenty inch or bigger a uh, a citation in Maryland, pro pretty much all over the country. Um, those fish, at least in the Potomac River and the Susquehanna River, uh, they're ten years or older, man. Some of those fish are you know it depends on how big they are, tw over twenty inches, ten to fifteen years old. Oh, my dude, dinosaurs. And um, and they've been around the block a lot, and. When you catch them when they're that when they're that size, I wonder how long it's been since they've been on a hook. Because um, 
because they're not, you know, they're not making those mistakes every day. No. They're not. And, you know, they only come, they only got a big small mouth seems to only come out when the weather allows it to come out. And it comes out under uh, uh, cloudy conditions when it's raining, uh, whenever, uh, whenever you just don't see a lot of sunlight and that they feel like they could sneak around. Um, or if a storm's coming in and you can see it off in the distance, the clouds are getting real dark. For whatever reason, it moves them. And, and they come out and they, they just throw caution to the wind. And that's when you seem to um, really hook into a, a real nice one. Well, well, speaking of that, so what are you saying? I'm talking about, I'm talking about like fish that are 21, 22, and bigger than that. I, I mean, we're getting to the best time of year to catch your, your PR by far. We're, we're getting to the winter time. The, I think, I think winter time, late fall and late, and really the dog days of winter are really my favorite times to fish for smallmouth, river smallmouth. It's when you can catch your absolute beast. You can catch a monster. Um, yeah. And you get the river to yourself. I mean, you, you just can't. I've been out with you and Travis Eden um, on the Shenandoah in the Upper Potomac proper. And that's the thing. is like you get the whole river to yourself. And every time you set the hook, it's not like, oh, it's three inches. No, it's – it's she's in the live well. It's a good one. And that's so much fun from a – if you are if you like the suspense of that, dude, it's fun. Because every time – They probably you, average – they probably – the the average size in the um, at what, some point in time, uh, once it gets colder um, – they don't get much smaller than 16 inches. So you're catching them 16, 17, 18 inches regularly. And then we, throughout the day, if you're having a good day, you'll hook, into, you'll hook into fish that are 20, 20 plus. We had 18 pounds when we went out last year. We easily had 18 pounds with our best five. I mean, but again, like you're not catching, you're getting five bites, but it's 18 pounds. And that's freaking, as a bass guy that fishes tournaments, that's, like, that's all you need is five bites if they're all, you know, that yeah. size. Uh, it's just so yep. much fun. Um, but right now, what are you seeing right now on the river? What parts of the river right now are hot? Um, anywhere on the river where I'm starting to find it behind rocks, you know, like religiously behind rocks, um, stretches of stretches of water that are shallow, real shallow. I'm talking a foot to two foot deep and where you have, um, uh, you'll see areas where there's grass. And then an open area, you know, where you see the bottom of the river and the grass is um, on either side of it. And they tend to be there, too. And they're they're on the shorelines. And then at some point in time during the day, you'll find them in the middle. I mean, it's it, it, you have to spend some time out there um, and uh, you, you, you'll see that. And. The, you'll also find them in areas, uh, you want to look for areas that transition on the bottom um, where you can see, there's certain areas where near the shoreline you can see leaves, like on the bottom, matted on the bottom of the river. And then just out from that, there's rocks. There's probably smallmouth there somewhere, especially if it's a if it's a seam, a current seam. You know, the trees down on the, on the shoreline, mm -hmm. they're going to be right around in that area. How um, much, how important is it this time of year to move? Do you, do you sit in an area a lot or do you actually move no, a lot? No, I'm drifting. I'm drifting for these small mouth. Okay. I'm just, I, I set up at, a, at one point and drift down river. And I use my trolling motor to zigzag back and forth on the river. Left and right, not down river. I just go to left, to the, to the left, to the right. Or I'll, if, if we've caught a few fish, on one side of the river, I'll stay there and keep keep drifting. If you had pick, to pick one section of the river, what would it be? To fish right now? Yeah. And I mean, like, I'm talking like going from Great Falls all the way up to Paul Paul. So, like, just just cut that area down a little bit. If we had enough water, um, that lander area. Why? From Brunswick down. Why? Because of the... Uh, the habitat that's there, the rocks and the um, transitional areas where it goes from uh, like pea gravel to bigger rocks. You've got uh, ripples that, you know, all the way across. You got ledges that are, are starting to become exposed and um, the fish seem to be, be uh, further back on those, those areas where you see a, um, white water almost and then it calms down. Like, for instance, if in the fall, if, if you're fishing an area, 
Like right now, you should be fishing around um, eddies that are, um, you know, decent sized eddies. And um, they're not necessarily going to be up on the rocks. They'll be at the tail end of it. Mm. And that's where I'm finding them at the very tail end of it. That's on both rivers, the Potomac and the Susquehanna. Interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Jeff, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on today. Um, please promote what you got to promote. Do you have any openings right now? Yeah, Halloween. <laughs> the 31st is a Tuesday. It is. And I got I got one other day, too. Um, here, let me see here. What day do I? Oh, I have the 27th, too, of October. I've been fishing for uh, almost a month straight. Dude, how do you do that? I, it, um, some days it's tough. And uh, you go with the good with the bad. It's the good days that keep you wanting to uh, go the next day, you know? So you, you, you'll, have a, you'll, you'll have a day that's not so good. And then the next day, it, it's like someone turns a light switch on. And they're, 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 they're there. And um, I don't know. I guess it's the... Uh, uh, you just never know. Every day is different. I guess that's what I like about it. And that's why I can do it. Guys, and then I'm not talking about just fishing one river. I, I mean, one day I'll fish the Potomac. The next day I'll go to Susquehanna. And then mm-hmm. I'll come back the next day and fish the Potomac. And then the next day I'll go to the Susquehanna for two days. And then I'll come back to the, uh, to the Potomac for a week. You have the best life. You really do, sir. Um, Guys, link in the episode description to everything that we just talked about today. Uh, As always, our Patreon supporter of this episode is Shane Crawford. Shane, thank you so much for being a Patreon supporter. If you guys would like to go over there, please try to become a Patreon supporter. As we hit our goals, our biggest goal overall is to create our own nonprofit to help stock all these rivers with smallmouth and largemouth just to help to promote our local ecosystems. Link to everything that we talked about with Jeff, Shallow Water Fishing Adventures, his website, his merch store, his store, everything will be linked there as well. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.